my career about the I think you're on mute, Gogo, sorry. Sorry. Good afternoon. Please note the public session of the meeting will be recorded and published online for public access after the meeting. Can all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphone when not speaking? The camera and the microphone should only be switched on when you are invited to speak. If you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand function on the Teams toolbar. I will now ask members participating today to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced so that this is clear in the recording of the meeting and can also be recorded by for the meeting. Apologies from Neil Kawi, Paul O'Connor and Jonathan Smith. So um, that's me taking the attendance now. Councillor Lynn. Present. Councillor Wiener. Councillor Wiener. I think Councillor Wheeler might be um, absent as well. Uh, go. He might not put his apologies in, but I don't think he's here today. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Alex Nicol. Present. Councillor Craig. Councillor Craig? Is it Councillor Greg? Yes, please. Yeah, Councillor Greg. Yes, I'm here, sorry. Okay. Gail Beatty? Present. Angela Scott? Okay, um, Caroline Hitzkos? Susan Webb. Susan's not here, can I go, uh, go, go, but I'm here for her, Gillian Evans. Thank you, Gillian. Luan Grejan. Hi, present. Chai Wing, you Wing, sorry. Present, thank you. Gordon McDougall. Yeah, here, go, go. Alistair Robertson. Yes, present. Professor Pete Edwards. Yes, present. Duncan Cockburn. Hi, hi Gogo. Duncan sends his apologies, but my name is William Hardy um, and I'm attending on his behalf. Thank you. Matthew Lockley. Yep, I'm here, Gogo. Richard McCallum. Yep, afternoon, Gogo. Lavina Massey. Yes, present. Um, so Lavina is substituting for Jonathan oh, yeah. Smith, and that will be that. Oh, chair. Thank you very much, Google. Um, uh, Kate Stephen, is she with us today, Google? No. I've not seen Kate Stephen. But okay. 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 That's fine. Um, okay. <laughs> well. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, welcome to those who are substituting for um, normal uh, members. Uh, you're, you're welcome today and we look forward to your participation. Also like to extend a, a, a welcome to Matt Lockley, who's joining us for the first time as Scottish Enterprise representative. Uh, we know Matt well because he used to work for Aberdeen City Council and so we are delighted that he's uh, joining us on, on the board. So welcome, Matt, to you. Um, Thank you, well, Welcome also to Che Ewing, who is, uh, Che has joined us on a, a few occasions, but he's here in his own right now, as he's replaced Bruce Farkerson as the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Service representative. So welcome to Che um, as a new board member. And I mentioned Kate Stephen because Kate um, is will actually take over um, the position from George MacDonald. Um, and as board members will know, George MacDonald was also the vice chair of the board. And um, uh, you know, hope that uh, Kate will also uh, take up that position. Um, just maybe a few comments on, on George before we move on, because as I mentioned, George was the vice chair of the board and he has recently retired 
um, from a, after a long and successful career with Police Scotland and uh, due to that retirement he also has to step back from the board position. Now um, George actually has been a board member for 20 months which maybe doesn't seem all that long a time because I know we've got members who've been on for considerably longer than that but I think I think we could all agree that he certainly played a very active part during that 20 months that he was the, the vice chair of the board. He um, had great experience around um, community planning from his roles that he'd had with Police Scotland in other parts of the North East. And he certainly hit the ground running when he joined the Aberdeen uh, Community Planning Board. Um, he certainly uh, was a great support to me uh, as vice chair and I you know, met with him regularly to, to discuss the work of uh, community planning across the city and how we could try to promote that as much as possible. Um, he felt a little frustrated, if I'm honest, that his time that he spent with us was in the virtual world that we've all had to adapt to uh, since COVID struck, um, because he was a, a person that liked to um, get it face to face with people and, and uh, have that both informal as well as formal um, communication and engagement. But um, he joined me on a number of meetings that we held uh, one to ones or uh, with board members, which I think helped us to, to really drive the agenda of the board forward as well. He certainly was very community minded and that uh, came through both in his police work and the work that he did as part of our board. And um, I, I met with him recently um, where he mentioned that he's taken some time out just to gather his thoughts before he makes any decisions about what he'll do in the future, which I think uh, is well deserved and well earned. But I think he's got a great deal of skills and his commitment to that community element and the and the people living within Aberdeen in the North East um, will certainly continue, I think. And, I, you know, I just on behalf of the board like to wish him well in the endeavours in the future. And I'm sure that he will be in great demand um, as a result of that. Um, I notice Emma's just put something in the chat that I think Kate will will join us. She's obviously been a little bit delayed from the start of the meeting, so we'll welcome her um, uh, into proceedings when she arrives. So thank you for that. And um, that takes us on. Are there any declarations of interest any members want to make before we move on to the agenda? Not seeing anybody indicating, so we'll take that as no, but obviously you're in type, you know, you have the ability to declare interest throughout the meeting as well if required. Um, that takes us on to 1.3, which is the board forward planner, which is there just laying out what reports we're expecting today and ones at future meetings. Are there any queries on that? Are we happy to accept and agree that? Not seeing any hands, so I'll take that as a yes. Um, that then leads us on to 1.4, which is the national update. I think we've got we have got Richard McCallum with us today, so welcome, Richard. It's nice to see you again. Um, in the customary practice, we do put out to board members before the meeting if there are any questions that they want to raise in advance, so that Richard uh, can, you know, obviously look at those and bring answers back. I don't think we had any uh, submitted this time round, Richard. So I don't know. Is there? Do you want to provide us with any verbal update, and then I can maybe open up to see if anybody has questions today on anything that you wanted to update us on the work of government. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, and, and afternoon, everyone. I'll just give, do a couple of uh, a couple of points, and then happy to open it up. But as ever, I know there's the the, the formality of if you've got questions in advance of the meeting, then 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 please uh, let me know. But outside of that always happy to to take views and comments and questions and what have you as well. Um, so just just as I say, a few, a few points from me. Um, I suppose the first thing just to to update um, the board on is that um, the Deputy First Minister met with um, a small uh, group from the Community Planning Improvement Board to discuss the role of community planning um, in relation to COVID recovery. I think it was a, a you know a really positive meeting. Uh, there was representation from COSLA and from several um, council areas as well as health boards uh, and other uh, representatives at that meeting. And I think really a, a focus on um, what has been some of the really positive things that CPPs have been able to take forward by way of priorities through the pandemic, um, what some of the learning that can be taken from that. 
but also what are some of the uh, some, some of the kind of blockages the barriers that that have been faced as well and actually a real kind of keenness to understand uh, as we go into perhaps more of a recovery phase what are some of the things that um, that, that that could be done to kind of support CPPs uh, work uh, more effectively and as, as well as possible so I suppose just to reinforce you know that really kind of uh, positive uh, message that there has been in terms of the role of CPPs over the last kind of couple of years and that commitment that there is um, moving forward particularly as we think about COVID recovery and and tackling some of the the real uh, key national priorities uh, for example you know the tackling child poverty and I suppose just on that that child poverty um, point um, the um, Scottish Leaders Forum uh, have an action group that published um, fairly recently um, a commitment to uh, a, a, a document uh, entitled Commitment to End Child Poverty, um, which is really a call to arms on actions that, that leaders and their organisations uh, need to be taking in relation to child poverty. Um, I think it focused on three main areas, uh, one around leading change, one on the focus on outcomes, and the third um, in relation to really taking risks in terms of innovation and doing things differently. And I know at the last board um, uh, meeting, there was an update on the child poverty um, action plan in, in Aberdeen, and it might be just worth um, dwelling on, on how that links and, and aligns with the, the action plan that was published um, through the SLF group. Um, on uh, on the national care service and again i think thanks to the to the board and uh, at the submission that was received from the cpa which what did form part of the um uh, 1300 responses that were received in relation to uh, the public consultation on the national care service just to update the board um uh the uh, th there was there has been analysis undertaken on all of the the uh, responses to the consultation that have been received and that was published the analysis on the 10th of February. If, if people haven't got a copy of that and would like it, I'd be very happy to kind of circulate that so, so that can be seen. The next stages from that is that uh, uh, officials in government will be reviewing all of those responses. There's dis uh, then further ministerial consideration on that. And then in advance of a, a bill coming forward in, in June of this year, uh, I expect over the next few weeks there'll be a further ministerial update in terms of um, both the scope of the of the bill and, and further intentions that, that the ministers have. But obviously this is a key area and one where there's a lot of engagement and interest across uh, across the uh, across the wider system at, at this time. A couple of other things just to mention in passing. Um, uh, another publication that that was launched was the R Place. Um, uh, a website which was launched on the 20th of Janu January. Again, I'd be happy to kind of share uh, a copy of this uh, or, or a link to this uh, uh, website. This is really just a, a place where um, some of the good practices around the place principle are being shared, um, some of the good work that's being done across Scotland. And in fact, one of the case studies is the Look Again Festival from, from, from Aberdeen and, 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 and picking up some of the real uh, positive work that's been done there. So again just to, to 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 let board members know that that's a site that has been launched i think has some quite uh, helpful uh, case studies uh, and points in relation to uh, the place principle and the very final thing just to say is that there is a review uh, being undertaken on uh, the public sector quality duty uh, and a consultation that is currently live until april 22 uh, and it's particularly looking on exp uh, expanding the existing duties on public authorities to publish information on their gender pay gap and also publish ethnicity and disability pay gap information too. So again, just to, to highlight that that consultation is uh, live and um, I think whilst it's primarily for the Scottish public sector and equality adv advocacy groups, uh, I'm, I'm sure they'd be keen to hear from a range of stakeholders. So I'll stop there, Chair, but happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks very much for that, Richard. Um, I think you've, you've covered a number of topics there that are, are very pertinent. I'm sure we'll maybe get questions from the floor around some of that. I'll maybe just kick off with a, a couple of things. Um, you know, you've obviously mentioned there about the Deputy First Minister and the discussions with community planning. Um, around that COVID response. You'll be aware, I'm sure, that in um, Aberdeen, we, you know, our socioeconomic rescue plan that was drawn up 
very quickly at the big, um, following uh, the COVID outbreak and you know lockdown happening, um, has been embedded within our local outcome improvement plan. So we're seeing those uh, streams and and work streams that were identified, you know, actually being actioned through the community planning partnership, which I think is an important. And as you've mentioned there. Um, you know the issues around the downturn in economies they affect that has on on uh, child poverty the issues that we're dealing with currently around fuel poverty in connection with high uh, cost of living uh, energy costs um, and other aspects around mental health i think is going to be a huge uh, factor moving forward because we're we're seeing that within um, school environments, we're also seeing, you know, um, the sort of social isolation aspects and the impact that that's having on both uh, child and adult mental health and the pressure that that'll put on services. So I think it's important that partnerships are, are you know, getting wrapped around the, the various aspects there. And I'm sure that's common themes that came out of those discussions. Um, the child poverty aspect, as I, as I mentioned there you know that's key to us it's the number one priority is that tackling of poverty within the city um for us and um i don't know i think we've got derek mcgowan perhaps with us today so i don't know whether he might want to add in uh, something around that action plan that you mentioned that was kind of discussed the last time uh, at the last meeting um but i think we can see from some of the reports that are on the agenda today and um, we're going to have a look at some um, deep dives, I think, later on um, in some of the projects that we've got, which, you know, we will maybe get further discussion. But I think we can see from the Fairer Aberdeen Fund annual report um, around just the types of things that have been happening on the ground. You know, you mentioned around that focus on innovation and things and how some of our projects have had to adapt as a result of the COVID situation. Um, and but it's it's also brought forward that there may be better work practices that we can bring to the fore as a, as a result of that, but there will also be challenges that we've got to try and overcome. Um, Derek, did you want to maybe say anything on that child action plan before I? Yeah, I did. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the update, Richard. I was interested there, you're speaking about the Scottish Leaders Forum. Um, I don't think I've seen that document you were referring to. I wonder if you'd be able to circulate that just to get them um, so we can check we're on track with it. Um, I mean, you've obviously seen the, the work we're putting in uh, addressing child poverty in the city and one of the issues we're, one of the aspects we're still waiting on is that national data set. And I just wonder if through your own position you, you could perhaps inquire on our behalf as to when that, that national data is going to become available. Um, you, you saw last uh, at the last meeting the amount of work we're doing here, but that national context is still uh, is still of interest in, in understanding what else we might be able to do. Um, and obviously what our city-wide rates are, actually are. So any help with that would be great, greatly appreciated, Richard. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Derek. Do you want to come back on that, Richard? Have you any idea when we might get that data? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure, to be honest, but I'll, I'll, that's certainly something I'll follow up and uh, I'll come back to you, Derek, on that specific point and indeed on the, the, the more general point about the, 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 the document itself. I'll make sure that's circulated and, and uh, you and other board members have got sight of that. And just um, chair to pick up on your your your, your earlier points. I mean, I think um, you know, I, I think even seeing it from this perspective, the work that the um, uh, CPA has done, and I think just um, uh, there's there's a lot of real strength in terms of the work of of the CPP here. That you know, I think there's there's other par parts of Scotland could could learn from, and 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 really, um, you know, I think you, you know you can see a lot of those priorities that have mentioned really embedded in in. You know, even on the agenda today. Um, I mean, I think one of the things as we talk about COVID recovery, and I'm, I guess Gillian Evans would probably say this more, more would know more about this than me. But you know, I, that that reality that whilst it's you know it is recovery, there's also the kind of ongoing, you know, societal and public impacts of possible future you know variants and what that might mean. And and there's something about. Um, I'm not sure if I like the term, but that's sort of living with COVID as well in terms of how that will impact and and how how do we um, address the kind of ongoing risks that there might be. But um, but yeah, this isn't going to be a kind of one or two year thing. This is going to mm. be a, a many years thing. And I think those those plans that, uh, that that you've mentioned in relation to some of those economic societal factors are going to be absolutely key. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you on any of those points. I suppose the 
as always, the, the challenging aspects are around that sort of resource that we can put in to, to help us, uh, you know, deal with the challenges that are being thrown up. Um, and, you know, I was mentioning there about, you know, sort of the mental health issues that we were maybe seeing or um, through, you know, in our in our schools and early years um, and how we can address that. And, you know, it's always welcome when Scottish government come forward with funding for specific projects. You know, I'm thinking like the uh, last summer, for instance, there was money provided to local authorities around um, some of the fun activities to try and make sure that um, we were um, helping to deal with the social isolation that maybe some of our young people were feeling as a result of COVID. And uh, well, government has, has, has put some more money on the table for that. For this summer, it's half of what it was the last time. And we're looking at how do we actually run some of these projects in the other holidays that we have, Easter, for instance. So it's these types of challenges, I suppose, when we identify um, ways in which we can uh, positively, um, you know, deal with some of the issues that have been thrown up as a result of COVID. It's just trying to make sure that governments are aware that that funding being, you know, one off or, uh, you know, restricted can often have a, a detrimental impact because local authorities or partnerships are not able to run those programmes moving forward in the way that they would want to. But I suppose I'm sure that you get that from from other areas that you go around, Richard, that are in the same boat. But sometimes it's that certainty about running programmes for a period of time as opposed to that sharp shock. Um, and, you know, uh, dealing with that, there's a frustration when we're not able to replicate that moving forward. Um, I think I've got another hand up from Luanne, so I'll bring Luanne in before I mention anything about uh, the National Care Service. Thanks. Thank you. And um, Jenny, my questions on the National Care Service, um, Richard, that you mentioned. Richard, are you able to give us a, a steer to us about the likely go live date for that? Because there's quite a lot of different um, ideas floating around about when that would go live. And, and secondly, you mentioned, you know, the importance of community planning in, in the future. And I just wanted to get a sense of how joined up the thinking is at Scottish Government between the importance of community planning and how a national care service will will kind of mesh with that. And, and I say that because we've got really good working relationships in, in, in Aberdeen and we really want to make sure the care is taken, that we don't destabilise the good progress that, that we're making locally. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for those questions. So on, on the first point, um, so the commitment is over the course of this parliamentary term. So over the, over this over this five year period, um, there is a commitment, as I said, to to bring the bill forward um, in June of this year. Um, and so but, but clearly, obviously, then a lot ha needs to happen between June and, you know, it's not actually that far away to the end of end of the parliamentary cycle, even even if it is about four years away. So it will be over the course of that 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 period. I think some of the the, the timelines of dates will still need to be worked through and that will be part of the the, the bill process that, that, that will, will factor that in. But that's the that's the broad and overall general commitment. I think on your point about um, and I am conscious, you know, even, at, you know, outside of the, the, the form, formal CPP, I mean, I think there's some really good working relationships that I see engaging regularly with the health board and with the, with, with the, the, the council and just some of those, those really strong and, and good relationships with the, the IJB as well. So absolutely, I think it, fundamentally that can't be de destabilised in terms of whatever we do. I think at the same time, um, you know, there are challenges in terms of particularly even the existing governance structures in terms of um, uh, how things can operate. Um, and I think one of the successes if, uh, if, if, you know, of an NCS would be to try and actually make some of the, um, some of the kind of existing challenges that we've seen probably with integration across the country more straightforward and, 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 and clearer for people so that that, um, that that some of the challenges that have been um, in terms of, for example, the the the, the ambition to, to shift the balance of some of that spend that has been quite difficult to do through existing the existing approach. I, I think you know a, a, a success of this would be to actually make that easier and make those kind of changes happen. But I certainly take the point that we don't want to destabilise where there is you know good good working relationships as well. I, I understand that. 
Thanks for that. Did you want to come back, Luan? You happy with that? Yeah. Uh, Lavina, do you got a question? Sorry, Lavina, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. I always get this wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, I think what I'd like to point out is Aberdeen is a bit remote from Central Belt. And as it's always, and I'm an 88 year old lady, so I know what I'm talking about, has always stood on its own feet in great many things and did things quite independently. And I would just like to emphasize that these care groups that have got up, and maybe Luanne would confirm for me that they have volunteers from the communities working along with them in these care groups to help people uh, uh, and, and things like that. And, and I think I would like to see the Scottish government of whatever colour it is in, in the future or, 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 or anything, uh, be aware that we're quite independent in Aberdeen, but we would like the money to get on with it as well and not think that our streets are paved with gold because we've had the oil industry here and things like that. So. I'm just trying to point out the differences between uh, the central belt and those further away from the central belt. And I'm sure this people from Inverness and the Highlands would be saying something similar to what I'm saying today just now, except that we have because we have a good population in Aberdeen sufficient to get some money from government, but not always we feel the, the, the things that we should be getting so that we can get on with things um, very quickly and independently if need be, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to, does it always have to follow a formula uh, uh, through the bills and things like that. I was chair of community planning in Aberdeen back oh, 2009, I think I retired. And at that time, we had businesses involved in community planning. Then the 215 Act came out and businesses were taken out of it. And I have seen that this has been detrimental. So <laughs> my, my job before I retired was a working in the scientific civil service. I worked in the marine lab in Aberdeen. And because of the research I was doing, I was a, a delegate to the Paris Commission, which set all the rules and regulations of how the oil industry, working along with governments from around the North Sea, how the oil industry would work within the North Sea to protect the fisheries and the environment, etc. So I'm bringing a, a wide perspective of really cross-party, cross-group, cross-communities working together in a better way. Uh, so, I, I, as you are new to this job, I think I'm just trying to let you see that not all parts of the country work in the same way. Sorry about being a bit pedantic about that. <laughs> no, I think that's a it's a it's a good point, Lavina. Um, well made that you know one size doesn't fit all, and sometimes I think when we look at a national perspective, we can sometimes think that everybody's in the same boat if there are failings and challenges elsewhere um, and you know I think we we feel a frustration in 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 Aberdeen in the northeast that um as, as you've pointed out there Richard that there are some real positives of the partnership working that's going on here and sometimes we find it's a retrograde step when there are national changes made at a national level to how the, that partnerships work or indeed the the actual um, services and things that the, the partnership is responsible for. I don't know, Richard, do you want to come back on anything that Lavina's mentioned there or? No, I mean, I, I yeah, so I completely accept the, the, the point. And I think, you know, there's, um, you know, there are some challenges that are, are the same uh, across Scotland, across other, you know, other parts of the UK as well. But there are some opportunities and challenges that are, different or unique to, to different areas. And I think that's why, you know, just going back to the very start and the importance of the CPP, uh, you know, that's where there's a real opportunity and, and, and that's where the real commitment is, is to that. Because I think, you know, and, and I accept that risk that, you know, there are national policies um, and how that then cuts across or works within a local context is really important. And, and actually that's why the, the dialogue that we can have here and elsewhere is really important to make sure that that's understood, that's clear, 
um and even you know i think the the input that that you played in on the 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 national care service i think was really important as well it's important that we're having that kind of um uh, discussion and and uh, engagement but uh, but yeah no I, I i i take the point okay th thanks for that richard i mean i think as far as the national care service goes i mean uh, you know luan has obviously asked there about you know the go live date and things and you you know you've kind of um, laid out there how you see that playing out in the in the coming months and, and years. I, I mean, there is a there is a frustration, I suppose. It was reflected, I think, in our submission, and it's, I think it will be reflected in a number that have gone in across the country, because I know from my work in COSLA that, you know, councils up and down Scotland are concerned about, uh, you know, what the proposals are. I think because they go much further than anybody had first anticipated as a result of the Feely report and things with a number of other services being pulled in. And so when we, you know, we hear that the bill might go in June of this year, which is not all that, you know, it's a matter of a few months away. It's it, the worry around that is, you know, is it moving too quickly without the proper consultation around some of that and what the consequences of pulling some of these services in into a national care service would actually mean um, for you know communities across Scotland and so you know my plea would just be that we continue to keep that dialogue up with both community planning partnerships and indeed councils across Scotland to make sure that you know we are uh, you know the proposals that come forward will meet the needs of communities uh, you know because at the end of the day you've mentioned there that the, although there are commonality there is all, also differences and they can best be dealt with at a local level in my opinion from experience um, sometimes and I think in this case some of the services that you know um, and the integration integration working practices that we already have in relation to some of these services I feel could could be put at risk by pulling them into a national care service that hasn't been thought through and hasn't been given that time to actually come forward with um, mature proposals, if I'm honest. I think that's been reflected in in the submissions we've made. But, you know, I think it's obviously I, I, I'm a great believer in make the points as often and as as you can um, through the process to see if we can get some uh, changes around that, but uh, that's just my feelings. I don't know if anybody else wants to chip in on that or not, or we can maybe. Oh, Lavina, do you want to come back? Thought across my mind that perhaps that that perhaps um, we could have some cross fertilisation of people coming from other council areas or whatever community planning partnerships to see where we are opposing each other and oh, this is the best way forward, our way is the best way, this sort of thing, to see how things work in other areas and 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 how, um, oh my God, if we'd thought of that, we would have made our job easier to look at that that way. Thank you for letting us know about it. But unless we have some way of doing that, it's going to hold the whole thing up. And maybe as Jenny is concerned about, the bill that comes in is going to go a step back instead of two steps forward. I think you're right, Lavina. It's about sharing best practice as well as identifying the challenges and things as well. Yeah. Matter. Um, OK, any other questions or comments or are we happy to move on? I think we're happy to move on. So thank you, Richard, for that. That was um, that was helpful for us. And if we can um, if you can access that additional information that we were obviously asking around the, the national poverty data set and things that would be helpful as well. Yep. OK, thank you. thank you. Right. That then takes us on to um, 2.1, which is our community planning improvement programme quarterly update. Now, you'll see that we've got three appendices with that, but I'm going to bring in um, Alison Swanson first to I think, Alison, are you going to give us a little um, overview of that? And then I'll open up to questions on the general um, report and then we can maybe move into the uh, project case studies, because I know we've got people joining us today that can give us uh, some information on that as well. So over to you, Alison. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. The board have before it the improvement programme report, which provides the update on progress towards the stretch outcomes and the improvement projects within the LOIB. 
At Appendix 1, which starts at page 33, you have the stretch outcome dashboards, and that shows the current status of the stretch outcomes. And from there, you'll see that we have, of the 15 stretch outcomes, we have two with a declining performance trend, those being stretch outcome 11, where we see that healthy life expectancy performance is declining, and our improvement activity for that stretch outcome has been affected by the COVID and winter pressures which have impacted the workload and capacity of NHS and health and social care partnership staff. And also at stretch outcome 12, we see that drug related death performance is declining and our improvement project activity under that stretch outcome has also been impacted. And that's due to us um, needing to secure new project managers. Then at Appendix 2, we have, as you've said, the three project case studies, one for a project under each of the economy theme stretch outcomes. So each of those case studies tells us the story of the project, the changes they've tested, as well as the outcomes and impact to date. And we have our project managers for those three projects um, in attendance today, and they'll speak to their respective projects shortly. And then finally, we have Appendix 3, which starts at page 59, 10 of the 17 scheduled new charters for your approval today. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Alison, for that um, summary. I think that'll be helpful for members. You've obviously mentioned there there's a couple of our stretch outcomes where we are, you know, we've got a bit of difficulties around that. And, you know, albeit the, the, the COVID aspect and the, and the uh, capacity that we've got. And I think that's reflected in the papers. You know, there's some additional information. But is there is there anything you feel that the board could be doing currently to try and um, you know Im improve that or remove the barriers that are that are holding up some of the work or preventing us from making the improvements that we're striving for well in terms of stretch outcome 12 i think we have gail as the chair of that stretch outcome here who would be able to advise if they felt there was any um, support that the board could provide okay gail do you want to come in on that is there anything that that we can do either collectively or within our own organisations to try and push that forward? So I think, um, although we're talking about stretch outcome 12, there's also, the, I mean, there are issues round about the resources, just round about the whole sort of alcohol and drugs um, partnership, which we have. Um, so I've had a conversation with public health with Susan about that. And, you know, we're looking at an action plan just about how we can make sure that we've got um, additional resources and the funding that um, hopefully we will get through um, Scottish Government, although not as much as we were originally anticipated, will allow us to put some project management resource around that just to move them forward. So I guess my plea would just be, you know, in terms of um, particularly health colleagues as we're sort of moving out of um, COVID, hopefully moving out of um, the intense pressures of COVID that we just um, keep our eye on um, the issues to do with um, alcohol and drugs, because that's that's an ongoing, unfortunately, um, public health emergency. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Gail. Gail, just on, on that funding aspect then, you know, about the resource, how is it significantly less than we'd expected and and is it is it short term funding because I, I met you you obviously mentioned there about additional resource and my concern as i've mentioned earlier is if we haven't got it to then continue with the work yeah, and, and certainly with the non-recurring funds we are very mindful um in the alcohol and drugs partnership about making sure that we have um, sustainability into all the projects and um, so it is about making sure that we make best use of of any monies that are coming forward i think where we've been particularly impacted at the moment is around about the mat money which is for the medical um, treatment where we're just trying to work through what the implications are um because the the, the programme wasn't able to be funded in the way that Scottish Government initially thought. So we don't have a final figure yet, but we will be bringing that back through the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership just to highlight just to highlight where those issues are. OK, that, that would be helpful, Gail, and maybe if we could have an update at the board around some of that things in case there's anything that we maybe need to do around representations around, you know, uh, and that would, and that would be helpful if we get to a place where th that support would be would be more power to our elbow. That would be great. Okay, thank you. Um, Lavina, you've got your hand up. I'm not sure if that's a legacy hand, is it? Oh, yes. I think it's a legacy hand. That's 
That's fine. We can't actually hear you, Lavina, because you're on mute, but I think that was a legacy hand, so that's fine. Any other questions on what Alison's brought or anything that Gail's brought to the table there? Not seeing any hands. OK, as I mentioned, we've got the um, Appendix 2, which is our economy themed improvement projects and the case studies. I thought it might be useful. I think we've got um, various people here to speak on those. If we maybe just take them in turn and we can maybe just get a kind of a verbal update and then if there's any questions. So I think the first one that we have, have we got Sam Lees here from CFIND that can give us a little update? Yes. Hi, Sam. Over, over to you, you if you want to say a few words. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Firstly, this is very nerve wracking, so um, hopefully I'll come across uh, well. Um, I just joined um, CFIN actually in um, August last year, and this is the first um, huge project I've been involved in. So it was a bit of a baptism um, um, of fire. Um, but obviously I was tasked with taking on this particular project um, which sits under the stretch outcome one which is nobody no one will suffer due to poverty by um, 2026 and in spe specifically it was to do with um, increasing pantry usage by 20% by 2023 and actually um, we've actually beat that target already. It, it, it's important to say, obviously, what CFIN does is um, we do provide, we provide emergency food, but we also provide um, uh, pantries and our pantries come in many different, um, many different forms. We have a pantry here in um, CFIN itself. We have two, actually. We have our main pantry and we have a pantry which is a best start and smile pantry which is actually aimed at families um, and um, those affected by um, oral health issues. And that was a specific project that we were running. Um, and in fact, that is uh, due to come to an end um, at the end of March. However, those pantry members will still be coming in to see fine and will be absorbed into the, to the, the greater um, pantry that we have here. Um, we also support the pantry at Woodside um, and we actually launched our um, pantry, a mobile pantry, um, the end of August, beginning of September last year. Again, I've been hearing um, very closely about, um, obviously, a, a lot of this meeting so far has been about the pandemic and, and the things that have affected. As you can imagine, um, CFIN had to go into a, a bit of... Um, obviously a situation where we had to close down a lot of the services, but this meant that we were taking our services out um, to people. So we were providing emergency food parcels. Those that were pantry members, we were making sure that they got um, their food delivered to them. And again, um, we, we got back up and running. And obviously this is where we were doing um, these test ch test changes, where we were, we had a system where um, we were getting our pantry members, for example, to phone in and book uh, a slot, which has actually worked really, really well. It's keeping beneficiaries safe. It's keeping volunteers and staff members safe. And actually um, for our beneficiaries, they actually like um, to be able to come in and know exactly when they can use the, the pantry. Um, it's really important to say, obviously, we do offer a food bank provision at CFINE. I think when most people think of CFINE, they think of food banks and food banks are important. But obviously, we, you know, there is a stigma around food banks. And the thing with pantries is it's about moving people where we can onto becoming pantry members, again, because of that stigma, but also because it creates that independence, it creates that sense of community. Um, it also means that there's wraparound services that we can provide for those pantry members. A lot of the pantry members um, that we engage with are people that will be referred through partner organisations. They're also um, people that will come through different programmes that we run. For example, we work very closely with Peterhead Prison on a programme. So when we have ex-prisoners here who are um, liberated um, and we've been working with them, they'll actually come into CFINE and become pantry members as well. And that encourages them to look at budgeting and be able to obviously um, get a good, um, you know, access, access to food. 
and again it's about that engagement i can't stress enough the the community aspect so yeah we 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 started off i think um we were looking to increase to um 584 members by march 2023 and we're actually up to 620 pantry members as i said that's across all the of the pantries um I know I've kind of jumped about a bit and I, I apologise um, for that. Um, it's important to also mention that we have a lot of volunteers um, that work in CFI. We couldn't exist without our army of volunteers and a huge amount of them um, actually work within the pantries. Um, in fact, you know, the, the main pantry here, it's mostly manned by our army of volunteers. Some actually come through as beneficiaries um, and are, are still beneficiaries but then we'll actually work within the, in the pantry as well um as i explained before about the food bank you know we've had eight beneficiaries that have moved, moved from emergency food that's actually gone up i don't have the exact figure that might seem really low but actually that it's to do with the quality not the quantity of that figure there will be some people that use the food bank who will never move on to pantry use. And that's because they have chaotic lives. They maybe have um, substance or alcohol um, abuse issues. And it's important that they still get access to food. And we are about being non-judgmental and making sure that every single person that comes through the door is treated exactly the same way. Though every now and again, we will have somebody who comes regularly where we can engage, we can point them to different areas within the organisation where we can support them with um, financial information. We can signpost them to other organisations such as SCARF. Um, we've, we've got a good relationship with the FIT team within Aberdeen City Council. So what it does is it, it does create this sounds really, um, you know, it sounds silly to say, but it is a, it is a family type community and it is about um, it's about encouraging those people to come in and also empowering them um, to move on, which is um, which is why, you know, um, we've, we've seen this. So I I've actually obviously jumped into this project. Um, I have to thank Alison Swanson, who's been fantastic, as has Susan Toms. Um, but actually, you know, I've come in on the tail end of this. This is the work that's been done by the um, volunteers, beneficiaries and, and staff at CFINE. And as you can see by that slide, you know, we've, there was a little, little case study there of somebody who said, you know, the access to food, which can be 25 to 30 pounds worth of food that they can access in the pantry shop. I've actually been joined on this call by our CEO, Fiona Ray. As a new girl, it's, I've just bought her, obviously, for, for hand-holding and if I've missed anything out. So I, I shall be quiet now and hopefully that was a, an OK update. Sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to get my mute off there. I noticed Fiona flashing onto the screen and I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'll give Fiona the opportunity if she wants to say anything, but I'll just start by saying, Sam, I'm not sure why you were so nervous because that was a fantastic uh, oversight of the projects and the work of CFINE. So so very well done in, in that respect. But um, if I don't know, Fiona, did you want did you want to come in on anything on the back of what Sam's mentioned there before I open up for any questions? I'll, I'll just very briefly say, how do I follow that? So I don't think I'll be saying very much. Uh, I just want to just say thank you for, thanks to Aberdeen City Council for the ongoing support we get for delivering this work, which uh, is not going away. And I think as much as we um, would like um, food banks to close, they're not going to close. But I think what, uh, not in the near future anyway, but I do think it's really important that this pantry development just continues to grow so that people get much more choice, much more dignity around how they access food and all the additional services that, that we can offer along with our partners across the city. So, but um, thanks to Aberdeen City for, for the ongoing support to enable us to do all this. Well, thanks very much for that, Fiona. And as I say, thank you, Sam, for, for that excellent overview I'm, I'm sure that will have been really helpful to the to board members to just see what that work is entailing on the ground um, i've been fortunate i've visited seafind quite recently actually so i've seen in action just uh, you know the the great work that you're doing there 
um, and you know it's to be commended and I totally accept what what we're saying about food banks because we will always have people that maybe just cannot cope with other things other than the food bank but I think one of the reports we've got later on mentions that those who are currently in food uh, insecurity a, you know, a, a quarter to a third of those people will never visit a food bank because of the stigma and things that is connected with that. So I think on that basis, there's clearly a lot of people out there who still require help and, and things like the food pantry gives them that opportunity to have that dignity and feel that, the, you know, by making uh, small payments, they are, you know, it's it's not in this in the same, uh, you know, criteria as perhaps food banks and the stigma that goes with that. But I think key from what I've seen from the work that CFINE does and other organisations in the city as well, it's also about that help and support that can be provided to people who are coming to access the food because that's it's about maximizing income it's about providing opportunities for people to move on uh, you know whether it's into employment or better paid employment all of those types of things i think are hugely important um, as people move forward and deal with the difficulties they've got their, in their lives at that time. And, and that's what I think is so impressive about what's happening. Um, we've obviously been really supportive of the, the mobile food pantry because I think as well it helps to get out and cover a, a greater radius within the city. Um, because sometimes, you know, the ones, you know, I've been at Woodside as well and, you know, I know it's a very busy um, food pantry there. Um, but, you know, I think if we can spread it across the city as well, that that helps us. And the volunteers, I think you mentioned that, Sam, about the, you know, you can only do this work because you've got the volunteers coming in. And sometimes it is people that have had the benefit of the services themselves and they're moving through. And that's the best type of community development because it's people that are giving back, you know, because they've obviously um, had the benefit of that and they're giving back to their local communities, which is which is really super as well. There was one question that I had because you mentioned there about the best start and smile um, a project. And I remember I came to the, I think it was a Torrey locality when it was first discussed and floated about doing it. And that oral health aspect is hugely important, uh, you know, setting that good oral health at a very early age. But I think you mentioned there, Sam, that that was coming to an end. And I wasn't quite sure why that was. Has it just reached the end? Is it finances, resources? What, what's the reason behind that? It, yeah, it's the, the, well, I think Fiona will probably jump in, but the financially, you know, it was only can, um, till March 2022, the end of March 2022, I believe that's right. So the funding is coming to an end, but it's something that we're still very, you know, it's it's not like we're going to go right, it's finished. It's no. something obviously that we want to still encourage, you know, those families. And mm -hmm. I say they, it, they will be, don't like the word absorbed, but they will be still part of the the pantry as it is. Mm -hmm. But we'll still make sure that they, you know, you know, we'll still do the oral health and we'll still make sure that they have access to that. Am I right on that, Fiona? The big yes, it's a Scot Scottish government funded um, project which we've done over the past few years um, and sadly the, the funding has come to an end for that but actually you know the work that's been done and the progress that's been made through improving dental health um, and particularly with children which the focus was on um, you know the Scottish government are, are very happy with the results of this and, and an evaluation is going to be presented at the end of March um, at the end of the funded period. So, but we'll continue, as Sam said, just to do the ongoing work to ensure that we can provide the um, information and also the resources for families to ensure dental health is, is maintained. Mm -hmm. Okay, Th thank you for that. Because I know it has been difficult with with the restrictions with COVID and, and dental um, practices, you know, not being open and things like that. It's I think it's it's vitally important that that, you know, um, promotion of good uh, sort of um, oral health and things like that and taking care of your teeth so you don't have to visit the dentist <laughs> quite as often um, is is really good as well. Uh, Gillian's got her hand up, so I'll br bring in Gillian next. And then if anybody else has questions, happy to bring you in after that. Thanks, Jenny, and thanks for the presentation on CFINE, which I'm a huge fan of, and you know that, um, which is wonderful. And it was on the dental, um, the, the, the dental part of the project. Um, what, so and this could be a good news story or, or not, actually, I'm wondering. Um, so I know that it had external support from the Scottish Government, but what you're saying, I think Fiona in particular, is that it will continue. 
Um, now, if that's the case, then the job that you've done is you've trialled something, you've implemented it, you've tested it, and you're continuing it without external funding, which seems to me to be a success if you are continuing it. Um, if not, I, I'm not sure what parts you're stopping as a result of the external funding drying up. OK, I think the key, the key. Hi, Jill. Hey, nice, nice to see you. The key thing there would be um, that the, the development work that's been done to grow and, and, and in, encourage people to come through that route to access that service. That work has been done um, as much as we can possibly do it within the funded period. What we will do is we will then go on and go forward and maintain what we've achieved rather than not do anything with that. But unfortunately, just due to additional work that would be involved to continue to grow the the you know the numbers. If people come on board and they want advice, we will be able to give that advice out. But what we won't be able to spend too much time on is going out and doing the development work on that. Um, just key to the project as well as the partnership with NHS Grampian um, and the partners involved in, in, in a number of meetings and advisory meetings and um, a, gosh, all the resources that we've received over this past period. Um, so we will still continue to use the resources through NHS Grampian. But the initial from from the start of the project to the to the end of the funded period, I think the the key thing there is the numbers of families we've managed to engage with through um, through work that has been focused directly on the dental health aspect. So, but I, yeah, I think it would be really sad if we just stopped doing that altogether because it goes hand in hand with what we do around health generally. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Yep, it sounds like. Fiona, that, that the development of spreading it, the proactive aspect is the bit that's that's going to be lost. Um, but the maintaining and, you know, if people come to you, then the information can be provided. But that actual outreach bit is the bit that's that's maybe not going to be funded moving forward. Yeah. OK. Any other questions for Sam or Fiona on what we've heard or anything else? Not seeing any other hands. So that shows it was incredibly um, comprehensive Sam so you've done an excellent job there and I think it was really great to see that testimony there from a user as well of just what an important um, uh, thing that you know the food pantries are for them and, and everything so just to to send our thanks to you for coming today and also the work that's going on in the ground and you can maybe send that back to the, the volunteers and others that are helping to deliver that for uh, very important work for communities in Aberdeen so thanks to you both and we'll definitely have you back, Sam, after that. OK, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very okay. much. Thank you. Thanks, you both. OK, that then takes us on to the um, real living wage and the and the work poverty um, case study that we've got. And I think we've got Martin Barry with us, have we? Yes, Martin. There you are. Um, Martin, do you want to maybe just um, say a few words about, about the project and then again I'll open up see if there's any questions. Thanks. Yes, th thank you Chair and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to the board today about the work that we're doing on the, the real living wage in the city through the Aberdeen Prospers Group. Um, now it was back in 2019 uh, when I actually joined the Aberdeen Prospers Group I was asked to take on this project around uh, increasing the number of uh, real living wage accredited employers headquartered in the city uh, and also for Aberdeen to achieve real living wage city status by 2026. So uh, back in 2019 I had initial conversations with Living Wage Scotland who were obviously delighted that we were taking this um, approach in the, in, in the city. So we had initial conversations with uh, accredited employers to see you know, if a project would be viable in the city and um, that resulted in a uh, event we held on Living Wage Week in, in, in that year. We had around 40 employers in attendance, so that was accredited, non-accredited, public, private and uh, third sector. And the feedback was very positive and um, you know, it showed that there was appetite to, to grow the real living wage movement uh, in, in the city. So we, you know, we drew up plans for engagement and uh, adapted change ideas accordingly. And that was all during the first couple of months of 2020. We were all ready to get going. And of course, COVID hit uh, 
lockdown and you know, clearly at that point of the project things changed the circumstances you know the, the conversations we were looking to have with employers were so far removed from the realities at that point you know they actually were you know bordering on probably inappropriate um so that was this was something that real living wage projects across the whole of the uk uh, were seeing and we actually took the decision to put the project on hold um, at that point in time, as did others uh, across the country until the situation became clearer. But we did keep up engagements uh, with the partners um, and, you know, you know, but, you know, given the forecasts at that time, we did kind of wonder how we would be able to get the project back up and, and running. But it was actually during the second half of 2020 and you know early 2021 that you know we actually although we actually maybe expected the number of accredited employers to fall actually the numbers started uh, in increasing and actually employers were proactively engaging with living wage scotland about achieving accreditation and becoming living wage uh, employers and it was due to that positivity that we decided to kick start the project around this time uh, last year. So we reviewed our project charter, uh, refreshed our, our change ideas, and we set out to make real inroads uh, into the project. Now, um, I guess the case study says it's up on screen. You know, the aim of this project is to alleviate in work poverty by increasing the number of employers paying the real living wage and, you know, um, meaning that low income employees benefit from uh, a pay rise. And, you know, I think it's a project that's needed, you know, just uh, even the previous presentation and you know, earlier discussions in this meeting. You know, we know poverty and deprivation exists in the city. You know, in the Lloyd states, one in five children in the city are living in poverty. And the fact is that you know, a large proportion of these children are actually living in households where at least one adult, adult is in work. And I think that really shows, you know, the impact uh, of, of low pay and obviously with the cost of living uh, increasing, it's the lowest paid who are really going to feel the the, the, the brunt of that. Now, the, I mean, the real living wage in itself can't solve uh, all the issues we face with regard uh, to poverty, but uh, I think it is an important uh, part of the wider anti-poverty work that uh, the Council and others in the city uh, are, are doing at the moment. And uh, I saw Derek McGowan on the call earlier on, and Derek and I have had a couple of chats and have presented to Derek's team about the work that we're doing to try and ensure that that work uh, is aligned and it's you know part of the wider uh, work that's uh, being done in the city. Uh, now, it was back in November uh, last year that uh, Councillor Lang actually joined um, staff from uh, Wood Group, or uh, Wood, I think as they're now just called, to celebrate uh, their accreditation as a, a living wage employer. And I think at that point, they were the 56th employer headquartered uh, in the city to become accredited. And actually, sit, since that point, uh, what we've done so, is just in a couple of months, we've now reached 65 uh, employers uh, accredited and headquartered in the city. So that's nearly a 30% increase uh, on the year uh, from this point last year, uh, and a record increase uh, in the number of accreditations uh, that we've seen. So I know it's fantastic when you think from the, the circumstances and situation we've been in that we've seen uh, these numbers uh, increase. So with that number, number of employers, that means that uh, over 24,000 workers in the city are now covered by a real living wage commitment, uh, and over 1,400 have received an uplift in their wages as a result. So I think that gives us a great baseline uh, to work on and uh, grow the movement uh, in the city. So some of the change ideas we're, we've been working on recently, obviously we're continuing to engage with employers, uh, accredited and non-accredited to promote the wage and seeking opportunities to communicate our, our messages. We're in the process of drafting uh, our action plan to join the Making Living Wage Places scheme and to do that we need to uh, bolster our action group with uh, a range of employers across the, the, the private and third sectors uh, and we, you know we're looking to build and develop a network of accredited and interested employers uh, across the city. We've been promoting opportunities through procurement uh, that the wage can actually bring. Uh, for example, we secured a slot late last year at uh, a Meet the Buyer event run by the Supplier Development Programme, uh, which the Council procurement team 
uh, presented alongside Living Wage Scotland, and that was very positively uh, received. And we're continuing to look for opportunities um, like that uh, to uh, help uh, support uh, organisations accredited and uh, help them, you know, resolve some of the issues that uh, they might face in that accreditation. Um, ACVO as well uh, recently carried out a survey of the third sector uh, in, in the city to understand some of the motivations and, and challenges around becoming accredited and that was a really useful exercise and the findings are very much aligned with what Living Wage Scotland uh, have found from similar surveys and that will really help us in drafting uh, the new action plan. As I said communication is hugely important not just with employers, but I think also with the communities we're looking uh, to help with this project. And uh, we've been working with Station House Media Unit uh, to help us do this. Uh, we recorded a, a show for Shmoo FM last year where myself, Living Wage Scotland and uh, an accredited employer were interviewed. And we're also looking to include articles in the various community newsletters that Shmoo, Shmoo produce. Uh, I think we uh, did the first one for the Seton newsletter last year, and we're looking to include at least one article in each of the community newsletters uh, throughout um, the, the year. So hopefully that has the dual benefits of informing uh, the general population, but also some employers uh, in those communities as well. So as I said before, the major ambition for the project is really for the city to become recognised as a living wage city. And through community planning Aberdeen, um, we've announced our intention uh, to do that, so I think I just put my camera off for some reason. Let me put that back on. Um, so, you know, we are drafting uh, an action plan uh, for that, and uh, we'll be looking to have that completed by the uh, Living Wage Week uh, in, in, in November uh, this year. So, th th there's lots of work still to do on that. Uh, and um, you know, there's a good group of people working on it, uh, but we know we need to bolster that. Um, with the public and private third sector employers, as, as I said, but you know we do have a healthy pipeline of organisations talking to Living Wage Scotland to become accredited, including some major uh, employers. So I think that's uh, really positive. And uh, you know, my you know, main ambition for this project is really to ensure that this is helping to make Aberdeen a place where you know everyone can prosper. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour uh, of the project. So I'm happy to answer some questions or you know any I can't answer get back to people offline so Councillor Ling thanks. thanks so much Martin again I think that was a, a really comprehensive summary of, of the work that's been happening and you know quite rightly you're you're highlighting that that often Aberdeen is seen as a very pr prosperous place economically and maybe people don't realize that the the numbers of um that we have that are affected by in work poverty because, uh, you know, as you've mentioned, there are numbers of families where maybe one parent is working, but because it's low wages, then, you know, that's impacting right right across the board. And um, I think you, you've done very well because there have undoubtedly been major challenges with that engagement and out, outreach that you've been trying to do around, uh, you know, engaging with uh, the business community and indeed third sector and, and private sector. Um, employers during that that period it can't have been easy at all so that's why it's all the more impressive when you see the numbers that you have managed to sign up because as you, as you mentioned I could hardly believe it was November actually the time is passing by so swiftly Martin that I I went to meet with Wood around that and I know that they were obviously pleased to be signing up to that and I think having some of, you know, you mentioned there about trying to get the message out and the different publications and things that you're using and the different ways you're taking to engage with both communities and employers. That's the way that we spread um, the benefits of, because there are obviously benefits for those employees who will now receive the real living wage, but we can't get away from the fact that there are benefits for the organisations as well, because they will attract uh, greater talent, you know, they will, um, you know, they will show that they are ethical uh, businesses and they will also uh, show that, uh, you know, to other businesses that might want to interact with them, clients and things, that if they pay the living wage, then they might be more attractive to receive that business from others. So I think there's lots of things in there to, to, to promote it, not just on the basis of it's helping people to live better lives, but it also helps the businesses, I think, to prosper as well if they're if they're shown to be paying um, proper uh, living wage to, to the employees that they have. 
Do we have any questions for for Martin on on anything that we've heard today, or obviously the the paper that was sent out as part of the agenda pack? Not seeing any hands shooting up. Lavina, do you want to just come in? I thought you might want to come in in this one. You're on mute, Lavina, at the moment. So, yeah, I'm saying, why did you think that, Jenny? <laughs> No, I, I think it's very important. My, my one question would be, would it have been a help if the Grampian Chamber of Commerce and the Federation of Small Businesses were also part of community planning? Would have that brought more businesses into realising the, the benefits of giving a decent living wage? Yeah, well, I have been engaging uh, certainly with the Federation of Small Businesses, Lavina, um, and they've been really helpful, um, obviously, just by, you know, Giving me some of the challenges that small businesses face. Well, I find those small businesses and the third sector actually make up the, the biggest proportion of, you know, um, accredited em employers. But it's been really useful. Uh, yes, I do need to engage with the with the with the chamber, um, and yeah, I mean any kind of uh, opportunity to to promote the 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 the, the project is, uh, is is fantastic. But yeah, yeah, but obviously that is what we need to do going forward. Is it, engage with business organisations and also trade bodies as well, so we can yeah. reach that wider constituency of, of, of businesses and really promote the, as Councillor Ling said, the benefits of the wage, not only to the individuals receiving uplifts, but also mm -hmm. actually to the businesses, because there was an economic benefit to, to this as well. And there was another question, I was busy trying to write some notes, and, and you mentioned something about uh, the sea fine or the pantry or food banks or something, were you sort of uh, working in conjunction with them in some ways? Uh, well, actually, I, I can't remember I, the point you yeah, made. I think mm -hmm. I think it's, like I said, my first uh, conversation was with Living Wage Scotland. I think then I didn't mention it, but my second conversation when I started the project was actually with uh, Dave Simmers, who was at Sea Fine. Then uh, to really yes, yeah. get my it's head close. around the impact of in-work poverty yeah. in the city, and you know, obviously the previous presentation, um, you know, um, from mm -hmm. that Sam made, um, which he resonated with myself and what you know David told me at the time, and as you said, Councillor, you know, I was that was the first time I'd visited, you know, behind the scenes mm -hmm. and see if I'm taken aback by what they were doing uh, down there and the scale of the operation, you know, mm -hmm. and the fantastic. Work, uh, that you do. So again, I need to obviously, if Fiona or Sam are still on the call, I need to kind of probably re-engage with them as well going forward. And that's what we're going to do with the action plan. We need to kind of really set out, you know, yeah. research the low pay landscape and really understand it as a priority. So you know, I'll be looking to engage with them, um, like the so CFI and etc. And any, you know, um, if anyone can give me any, uh, uh, if anyone you think I should be engaging with, you know, I'm quite happy to, you know, yeah. discuss that yeah. offline. Yeah, I, I know that all these things go on to the community planning um, Aberdeen, uh, what do you call it, uh, websites and, and Facebook and Twitter, which I step right away from. I'm too scared of them doing something stupid. Uh, but but uh, I feel that, that, the, that the things going on are very good, but maybe we should be looking at some other ways of publishing it more, getting, getting it out into face, Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it, uh, as well as just, you know, putting it on the websites and things like that. Maybe they are, and I haven't just caught up with it at all yet, but yeah. I, I, we, we, the more we publish, the better we'll be able to do this community planning stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think Martin was nodding there that I think that is the case that it does go out on social media as well. They'll, you know, looking to utilise any channel that we've got at our disposal. I'm a bit like you in social media, I have to say, Lavina, but I know <laughs> we're in the minority these days. I have to say yeah. it's probably yeah, the way yeah, to cascade yeah. the best information to people. Yeah. Maybe just uh, at that point, Councillor Lane, if I could just say, obviously, we are developing a comm strategy and actually ACFO, and we were helping out uh, with that um, going forward. But obviously, Living Wage Scotland and the Council as well are obviously pushing out messages, you know, when we can. But, you know, obviously, the, the work that we are doing with the community newsletters, as well as hopefully managing to push that message out uh, wider as well. Excellent. Thanks for that, Martin. I'm going to bring in, if you're OK, Levine, I'm going to bring in Matt because he put his hand up just as you were speaking. So I think he might have either a question or something maybe to add um, on that discussion. So, Matt. Uh, 
bring you thanks chair and thanks martin it was great to see um the progress been made by the group uh, under your stewardship so it's good to see but just a comment really in terms of the action plan to 2026 and and the city getting real living wage status in its own right as a as a place i just wonder what what the kind of stepping stones are to get to that and i, I suppose an observation related is that um certainly from the scottish government's perspective but things like um the freeport initiative for example and the just transition fund will all have real living wage as a as a kind of formal requirement um in in the way that they are structured so for businesses to benefit from either of those funds or, or incentives that flow through free ports, for example, they'll have to sign up to the real living wage. So there's maybe some more structural levers that we could factor into your action plan going forward in, the, in that context of 2026. Yeah, and I, and I think that the key thing, Matt, is, you know, we do get that business, you know, and employer input into the drafting of, of the action plan, because as you know, you know through, through a quirk of you know, SE internal geographies, I actually also sit on the Dundee living wage action group and i'm also you know there's a wider living wage places network being uh pulled pulled together so there is that kind of peer network i've discussed with individuals who've pulled together Edinburgh's plan you know that was launched uh, recently so there's a good peer network and they all are very supportive of other places and are looking to 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 help out um you know and obviously you know what we have to do is kind of set targets but also look what makes aberdeen unique in this landscape um as well because as we said before you know, one size doesn't fit all, you know, so we've got to really kind of research the low pay landscape and, you know, take account of, you know, what's happening in terms of the development of the regional economic strategy, for example, going forward as well, ensure that's embedded in, you know, that um, going forward as well and tying all these different strands together, as you say, Matt. Thanks for that. Just to come back on that, Matt, um, the aspect of, you know, because you've obviously mentioned the free ports and we're all aware of, um, you know the the situation and the hold up there as to you know get trying to get an agreement around it, and that um, you know um, national living wage um, aspect as as part of that of real living wage. It is it actually you know are they going to bring forward legislation in relation to that because I'm aware that we've had some challenges in some other areas around procurement when there is guidance there that we should be insisting that you know whoever wins the bid actually has um, that built into the contract. But legally, we're not able to enforce it because the legislation doesn't back it up. So is it your understanding that when they, the Freeport aspects, that it will it will actually be a legal requirement or is it just will it just be guidance from Scottish government? I don't have a direct answer chair but certainly i mean i think the the delay in terms of the freeport announcement was due to some of the the conversations between the two governments about how this could be handled um i think the, the scottish government's view is very clear that they would like businesses that locate in a freeport and that therefore benefit from tax incentives including national insurance rebates that, that i suppose the kind of the, the the quid pro quo of that is that they would be real real living wage employers um uh, so i think certainly in terms of the, the bidding process the the northeast consortium will have to demonstrate that it's got some thinking around this and and some plans of how it would work but whether it would be formally legislated for i, d I don't know it's not that clear yet see i think i think that's the difficulty because i don't think there will be anybody that would be saying they didn't want that to happen just the same as within contracts but sometimes because it's not in legislation we can't you know we're, we're open to challenge around that and i think that's the great area that often when it's guidance people think well we should be able to actually enforce it but we don't have the the legal backup for it so i'd be interested matt maybe if we can maybe we get some further information on that because i think it will be important and i'm conscious with three ports although it, i mean it's not local authorities that make the bids it's actually the ports themselves but there's quite a tight time scale around the actual uh, calling for bids and then that bidding process you know it's a matter of about 12 weeks or something I think like you know so we haven't got huge amounts of time around some of that but so if we could get that information that would be helpful okay um Lavina your hands up do you want to come back in sorry Lavina you're on mute We'll get I, to grips I with always these do this. Yes. At the end of the day. Yeah. Right. What are, the thought has come to me that if we are 
as, as uh, uh, you know, that you're all applying for these green freeport. Uh, if you can say that we're applying for this and this is what we would do with it and we would have this living wage and all the other things you can think is very positive in order to attract the business. Can you write from that side of it without them saying this is what you're going to have in your fleet port, you know, sort of idea. I, I, I think that's maybe what Matt's saying is, that, you know, that conversations, as I've mentioned, although local authorities, both Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, have been working with partners around uh, the possibility of a free port in the northeast it's actually the ports themselves that make that application not local authorities so it would be up to them to determine at that point you know what the what that bid looked like when it went in but i'm i'm certain that uh, you know those discussions are obviously happening at um, official levels uh, with with the partners involved and i'm sure that anything that can be done at a local level will be done um within the the you know the law to back it up Lavina I'm sure yeah yeah that 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 is very important that we are very much proactive in putting forward how we would do it yes you know, so so that um, they can see <laughs> all the sort of things we, that we would do like protecting the environment in the area some things that you have to put in sometimes that you think oh my god well, that would be helpful. I never thought of that. People mm -hmm. coming forward, and I don't know who's all involved in all of this. Uh -huh. I didn't it's realize it. It was actually the Port Authority of Aberdeen Port Authority will be doing this. Yes, it's <coughs> the Port Authorities that make the application, um, and there have been a number of stakeholders, uh, you know, inputting into that. And although there's been a delay in them coming forward with the announcement around how many there'll be in um, Scotland. And um, that working group's been working for a considerable period of time because the announcement around free ports came some time ago and you'll be aware that some have already been established in um, England already. But we've, we've, seen, kind of, we've, we've, we've kind of come right off the, the subject matter that Martin was here to deal with. So maybe yes. I better get back on track on that. Um, and then we'll because we've still got a few things to get through on the agenda, if that's all right. But I don't see any other hands. So thank you, Martin, for that. Really appreciate you coming today. Um, okay. It's a hugely important piece of work, not just for the partnership to, to meet its target that we've set, but also to improve the lives of uh, people living within Aberdeen as well by providing um, you know, proper wages. So um, anything that the partnership can do to help drive forward that, that business, you've got our support on that. I'm sure I speak for everybody on that. So mm -hmm. thanks again for, for coming today and presenting that. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. OK, now we move on to our uh, third case study, which is actually about Aberdeen Responsible Businesses. And I think we've got uh, Michelle and Charlotte Saunders here from the City Council To Is it Michelle, are you just going to say a few words on this one before I just open up, see if there's any questions or Charlotte? Um, yep, there's Charlotte there. Um, at Kisler Lang, I can just give a couple of um, opening remarks. The board will recall in September last year, we agreed to include a specific aim in the LOIP about increasing the number of responsible businesses we're working with in Aberdeen. Um, we know that Aberdeen has many businesses that have been resilient to the impact of the pandemic and they've got a genuine desire to give back to the city and support their local communities. So this project is about channeling that desire and the efforts of businesses to help achieve our shared priorities and to divert business support to those communities um, that we see are most in need. So, as you know, it continues the work that had already started to build our relationship with the responsible business community across the city. So by September last year, when we put the aim in the loop, we'd already formed a partnership with seven businesses and our project aim was to increase that by 200 um, percent, which would be 21 by the end of 2023. So as you can see from the case study, we've already increased the number to 16 since September last year and that was largely the result of the responsible business event we held in November and just picking up on some of the leads we had um, with our contractors. So <clears throat> we have a further 10 leads from the responsible business event that we're hoping will result in collaboration and if they did we'll actually have achieved our aim for this project. 
but as we're building some momentum, it does present opportunities for us to think about how we develop this further and what it means to have the status of an Aberdeen responsible business partner. Because at the, the moment we're working very much with the willing and those businesses that have come forward, which is great, but going forward, we'll want to think about whether there's some criteria that we have that a business needs to meet to achieve that very important status. So for example, we've just heard um, about the real living wage project. So perhaps being a real living wage employer might be one of the expectations we agree to have um, to recognise a business as a, a responsible business partner. Um, you'll also see in the case study that we've highlighted some of the examples of how businesses have been working with us. And part of this project is about looking at how we ensure that these are lasting relationships that result in ongoing collaboration rather than one off pieces or projects. And a lot of a lot of that's about relationship management and really want to emphasize that all partners have a role in this. You all have links with businesses and have that opportunity to influence. Um, so these are some of the considerations that the project team will take forward. Um, you'll recall in September, we asked partners at that time to identify colleagues to get involved in this work. And we do have a number of partners on our project team at the moment, but we'll be hoping to expand representation further um, and also want to include some of our responsible business leaders and how we shape it going forward. So as you mentioned, we're joined this afternoon by Char Charlotte Saunders. So Charlotte is leading this project uh, going forward. She's, she's new in the position, uh, but she's got some fantastic ideas about how we can attract new businesses and build on what we've achieved so far. Um, you'll notice that in the case study, one of our change ideas is having a single point of contact for businesses mm -hmm. um, to reach out to Community Plan in Aberdeen and, and Charlotte has picked up this role and is making some good connections with businesses to explore what more they could be doing for the city. So hopefully just a, a wee overview there for you of how things are going. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Michelle. And and welcome, Charlotte. Is there? Did you want to add anything, Charlotte, or do you just? Uh, no, nothing to add. Thank you for that, uh, Michelle. And yeah, I'm new to the role, as uh, Michelle said there, but I'm really excited. We've got some good ideas, so I'm looking forward to getting on with it in 2023. Right. Sorry. Yeah. That, that's what that's what we need. Well, it'll be ongoing work, I'm sure. So 2022, 20, 23, it'll all be happening. But Charlotte, thank you for that. And I think, you know, the point about that single point of contact, I think that's key because often people get the frustration if they can't get through to the right person that, you know, they find that as a blocker. So I think having that is is super important. I think the point that you raised, Michelle, about you know, all partners getting involved in this, because sometimes when you look at it, you think, oh, you know, it's maybe not quite so pertinent to, to our organisation. But I think everybody does have that ability to engage with business. And it's about getting that message out. I think we can see the progress that, that, that we're making. That second event that we did, Michelle, although we were still a little frustrated because we couldn't have it as a, a live event, we did meet the presenters met together and we uh, delivered it as a virtual event to others. But I think what it was really good at that meeting uh, that we held was we were hearing from their direct experiences. And it's a bit like when we were talking about, um, you know, Martin's project um, around the benefits that are for business. Often we look at it that the benefit is for the communities and that is certainly there. And that's what we're trying to strengthen and make sure that we're channeling the resource into those areas. But there are also great benefits for businesses that get involved. They look as if they're more attractive, I think, to particularly young people that are coming forward if they have that you know, ethical aspect at the core of their business. They're giving people the opportunity to volunteer in communities and things like that, get involved. And I think they strengthen ties um, right across the city. So there, there's lots of positives there. Um, if we, you know, if we work together to to, to roll that out, but you know, to commend uh, you, Michelle, as well, because I know that you've put in a huge amount of work since we first started talking about this, um, you know, a, a few years ago, and uh, you know that groundwork is is paying off, and the benefit will be to communities because we'll be channeling the resource that is out there in the business community into the areas that are most in need, which is great. 
Any other questions from anybody on the board on that one, or are we happy to move on? I'm not seeing anybody's hands up. So um, as Alison mentioned at the beginning, we've got three appendices, um, the, the overview, the uh, case studies that we've just talked about. We've also got a number of new charters which are laid out. Does anybody have any questions on the, any of the new charters that are there in Appendix 3? Not seeing anybody indicating, so I'll take it that we're content with what's there. Right, we do have a number of recommendations in relation to this paper, which appear on pages 31 and 32. Um, are we happy to agree those? Oh, sorry, Luanne, did you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. It was just a general question. I suppose a lot through the, the papers we're hearing about capacity and, and you know, mm -hmm. staff problems just at the moment. And I just wanted to get a sense of how do we know the staff that we're, you know, we're asking more work from are, are able to deliver on, on these on these new um, areas mm -hmm. as well as the existing ones just two years into into the pandemic, just just to get a, a sense of how that's mm -hmm. been balanced with staff welfare as well. OK, I'll bring Gail in because she's put her hand up to answer that one, I think, Luan. I'm not I'm not sure I can solve it, but I can certainly um, answer um, just about how we're trying to manage it. So, Luanne, that's really the sort of the role of the management group. So within that, we are acutely aware of what the pressures are on everybody. So um, each of the thematic leads obviously meet within that forum. And if there are concerns, um, that's the place where we're trying to resolve that and trying to make sure in terms of the balance of it's not the same willing volunteer that's um, identified every time um, across across the projects. Um, we're also really clear with the thematic leads that if it does look as if there's a particular um, ask on somebody that's not able to um, not able to deliver on that, that we get an early warning of that. And that's part of why we've been introducing the tracker, just so it's it, it can sometimes be uncomfortable reading when you're seeing your project in red or, or, or in amber, but at least it's allowing us to be able to manage that and to be able to manage people's workloads so that it's it's not the same, it's not the same well kent faces that are seen on every project. And partners have been really good in terms of being able to you know, take on that message about sh spreading out that work um, across their organisation. Um, and Michelle and Alison and the support team, you know, are really keen just to make sure that everybody that comes into the projects are, are supported in that way. Hope that helps. Thanks, Gail. Thank, thank that. you. OK. OK, um, not seeing anybody else indicating. As I say, the recommendations um, you know, we're obviously being asked to, to note the information that's there. We're being asked to agree the new projects which are laid out in Appendix 3, the new charters that are there. And also we're asking board members to, um, you know, cascade the information around the projects and things that, that are being updated, um, you know, through our channels so that people are aware of the work that's happening. Are we happy to agree those recommendations? Not seeing anybody indicating otherwise, so I'll take that as a yes. Thank you for that. That leads us on to 3.1, which is the Fairer Aberdeen Fund Annual Report. And I think we've got Susan Toms with us. Susan, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, Susan. Did you I want am. to say a few words about the report? And then I'll open up, see if anybody's got any questions. Um, OK, just details um, what the Fairer Aberdeen Fund achieved over 20 to 21. Um, obviously, the the purpose of the fund is tackling poverty and inequality, so it fits with the anti-poverty um, stretch outcome quite well now. Um, so we also had, as well as all the usual programme of, of activities, we did have a hardship fund for um, addressing issues relating to COVID. So we got a lot of additional funding out to smaller groups that maybe wouldn't normally get funding through the fund. And we're just in the process at the moment of looking at applications for next year. Thanks very much, Susan. And then we can't underestimate the work that's put in in sifting those applications. And I know that it, it, we're ongoing at the moment at, around that. Um, and, you know, the volunteers that sit within the Fairer Aberdeen Fund are to be 
congratulated on the on the efforts that they put in at that point because I know they're incredibly diligent when they go through those applications and they also are very um, you know keen to make sure that it is aligned to the priorities that we'll have within the local outcome improvement plan and um, which is an important for that work and um, Lavina you've got your hand up did you want to come in Lavina, sorry, you you've not got your mute button off. That's it now. <laughs> yeah, time I just wanted to congratulate uh, everybody in, in dealing with this because it's such a wonderful project. It came from government money original. It was Fairer Scotland Fund, and it was dribbled down and dribbled down. And I don't know what do you have that nowadays to spend on it. It was one point eight the last I knew. One point eight million. 1.6 million, which comes from council. Okay, uh, now it doesn't come from Scotland yeah. anymore. No, it comes totally I, from. I, I think City this council. is one of the most successful groups that, that that is in existence. I wouldn't say it's cheap to run, but I think it's very good value for money, and the the, the, the wonderful things that are done and and people appreciate it very much as well. So I'm so glad that it's continuing because I cheered it for a while and, and I really know how much it stretches out into these areas that badly need it. So, yes, congratulations and keep the good work going. Uh, I don't know how we could help you to get a bit extra money for the job, but uh, I would like to know how I, I, I would speak up for it if I knew who to talk to. But Thank th you thanks for that, Lavinia. I mean, I think... Susan would advocate if we can speak to anybody to get extra money coming in that, that all the better because as you've I've mentioned there the 1.6 million comes from um, Aberdeen City Council funding and yeah. um, we've obviously got a budget in uh, a couple of weeks time and yes um, you know hopefully that will be maintained moving forward and um, I think I mean it's an excellent report that's the first thing to say yeah. and I think the way it's laid out is is really good because you've got feedback coming from from groups and things like that to tell you just how important the work is on the ground and yeah. um, Susan knows it's close to my heart because I chair the Fairer Aberdeen Fund board so um, you know I, I see firsthand um, what the volunteers are, are doing and I think that's reflected in the report because despite Covid we still had 630 volunteers uh, during that period and now it's it may be a little less than we've had previously, uh, you know, due to shielding and, and various things. However, they still managed 120,000 hours of volunteering time, and that equates to 1.9 million pounds of added benefit. Yeah, benefit. And I think that's the important thing to reflect on top yes, of the 1.6 financial yeah. amount going in. There's that 1.9 million added benefit coming from that volunteering sector, which yeah. is hugely important. Um, 36,000 people benefiting from it on the ground in the projects yeah, yeah. and 10,000 of those under 16 and um, which you know from what we've been talking about earlier today it's really important that we're that they're being able to access the the projects and things through that I, I think it's also very impressive the way the projects managed to adapt to COVID because um, you know a lot of the services are delivered face to face yeah. and that was not possible so you know the use of technology and also looking at ways innovative ways in which they could provide that support and assistance is reflected in the report and I know that's continued uh, you know in the in this current year as well but they also did make sure that there was still support out there for those who are digitally excluded because we have to remember that not everybody has been able to get into the virtual yep. world mm -hmm. so they have maintained that as well which i think is excellent and the range of projects again it's across the board you know it's about the accessing employment and education and training it's about maximizing that household income and money advice people being able to use credit unions where they're getting that to uh, affordable loans mm -hmm. parent and family support counseling sessions youth work promotion of physical and mental well-being, community safety, there's environmental projects there, adult learning and support for ex-offenders. We've talked a little bit about that today and the importance of that and also about the tackling uh, food poverty. I think Susan mentioned there about poverty being the first priority we have and accessing the, the healthy, affordable food. And we've heard from CFINE today about some of the work that's going on 
through their organisation, but there's also a number of projects in the city. So I think everybody's to be commended for the work that's going on. I'm sure Susan will feed that back um, from today's proceedings. Yeah. And um, and as I say, if we can lobby at any any level to get additional funding, because well, I, I think I, Susan, I, I, I don't know anybody on in the newspapers or, or anything like that, but you know, a two page spread in the P and J would be wonderful to let people know about it and the success of how things can be done with small pockets of money, you know. I, I, I don't know how we could do that, but well, sometimes we'll be at the press watch that, these. You could spread that into the charters as well and get more maybe volunteers helping with them as well, you know. So, yeah, I don't we're, know. We're, we're trying That's to why I'm out. telling Jonathan to get somebody yeah. younger. <laughs> We're, we're trying to keep going. Yeah, we try, we try to spread the word out there. And I think, um, you know, as you mentioned there, you know, if if the media wanted to cover it, I think it would be good because it would be good recognition of the hard work that people are doing actually in the heart of communities. So sometimes they watch these recordings, Lavina, so you never know. The other aspect I think it's important to point out, Susan mentioned about the community support fund and that was additional money that came. Um, 360,000 and again the board came together to allocate that money at quite short notice and took time to look through the various applications which was appreciated because we had 47 additional charities and groups who wouldn't normally have received funding through Fairer Aberdeen were able to carry out work um, on the ground right across the city not just in priority areas and things. And that was another additional, I think, six and a half thousand hours of volunteering time. So all in all, I think there's been a great effort to help bring that support to communities and the report um, helps to reflect that. And, you know, it's just important that we all play a part in cascading that information and, and you know, making sure that people are aware of the help and support that's available out there, but also on the good work of the volunteers in, the, in Aberdeen as well. So. Um, if you can pass on our thanks, Susan, to those involved, I think that would be appreciated by everybody on the board today. And that was here, obviously, for us to to note the um, the information that we have there, which I think we can all do. I'm not seeing anybody saying anything different. So thanks, Susan, for your time today. Yeah. That's appreciated. No problem. Thank you. Right, that takes us on to 3.2, which is the Child Friendly Cities update. Now, I think maybe have we got Matt Reed with us to take us through Matt? Hello. What's going on? Can you maybe just give the board an update on where we are? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So um, the kind of purpose of my report is really to share where we are at the moment in terms of our, our journey. Um, we've very much coming towards the end of having, I suppose, the action plan process completed, but work as hopefully you can note in the report has kind of continued anyway in terms of the delivery element of it and um, the the kind of action plan process is been slightly delayed and um, because the format had had changed slightly from what we'd originally been working with and um, so we've since i've actually shared this one with you there's been a little bit of work going on in the background to really kind of update that action plan and there's a, a second iteration of it being worked on at the moment with badge leads and there'll be one-to-one -one, um, sessions and support delivered with each of the badge leads and UNICEF to really kind of shape up and finalise that report. So it would be my proposal to bring that to the next board, which I think is April. Um, 20th of April, yeah. So that should at that point be the, the final version of that of, um, action plan. But I've had conversations this week with UNICEF um, as part of our management meetings, which we have on a kind of a six weekly basis, really just kind of sharing our progress. Um, they've given certainly very positive comments to the report as produced at the moment. And I've said that we're, we're certainly quite ambitious in our targets. Um, but I think I think that's really something that we should be striving for. So I think we're on the right road um, to really kind of moving forward with the, this is, and, and the, the time scale that we're really trying to work on now is to have that action phase, action plan phase completed, as I say, in kind of April um, and continue with the delivery with a view to a kind of a two to three year window of accreditation is sort of the suggested time scale for UNICEF. But you will see that there's a range of different areas within the badges that we're currently progressing anyway. 
Um, some of those have, have subsequently moved forward a little bit again. And um, one notable one which I'd highlight would be with place where we talked about having um, a child friendly place based toolkit that the Scottish government were looking to develop. And um, so they have actually invited us onto a pilot of that. And we're, we're currently working up a model of how we'll use that with both schools and community groups that work directly with children and young people. We've developed a youth network now and they've met a couple of times um, and that'll be a fundamental part of this programme really to ensure that children and young people are involved in influencing the plan and really kind of shaping decisions within it. Um, and we're working up a, a range of different kind of communication approaches which hopefully will be more engaging to children and young people. Um, and we're getting the messages across in the right way. So we've had some really interesting feedback with them, which we'll kind of incorporate into our communication strategy. And partners are delivering a range of different things and looking within their own organisations as, as well as supporting a partnership approach. So um, definitely making progress um, and, and really just wanted to provide a, a quick update on where we are at the moment with, with that. Th thank you very much, Matt, for that. Um, I, I know that there is... Um... There's been a bit of frustration, I think, about you know the the, the time the, with the UNICEF and the communication back and forth, and it, it's always a bit frustrating, I think, when you're trying to shape up the criteria and things that we're working to. But it's it's heartening to hear of the good work that's been going on in the ground, as you know, simultaneously to those discussions taking place. And I know, in our own organisation with the plans that we're bringing forward in relation to the master plan and the beach. We've very much been engaging with young people around that. And I think uh, next week we'll, we'll see a video that they've made around some of the ideas that they have, which is is really good um, to, to see that on the ground. And I know from the report, other um, partners are also uh, you know, engaging uh, young people in the same way in order to try and uh, uh, help shape up the plans that they might have. Are there any questions for... Matthew and any of this? No, I'm not seeing anybody indicating. So sorry, we've kept you right to the end of the meeting, Matthew, <laughs> sitting through, and we haven't got we haven't got any questions. But I think it, you know, it shows that the information that you've you've provided within the papers has obviously um, helped people to just uh, understand how we're progressing with that. I think you're looking for us to approve the draft action uh, log frame that, in principle, that we've got there, as you've mentioned and uh, obviously continue to endorse the work that we're doing and we'll get as you've mentioned future uh, progress reports on that so hopefully everybody's happy with that and doesn't have any issues with agreeing those no i don't see anybody indicating so thank you again for for coming matthew that was that was good to just get that update we appreciate that and i know we've our meeting's been maybe a little bit longer than normal but i think we've had some good discussions around some of the papers there um, and it just leaves me to say that the next meeting that we have is on the 20th of April. So look forward to seeing you all then, unless there's anything else anybody wants to raise before we go. Not seeing anybody indicating. So thanks for your contribution today. And thank you, Lavina. It was nice to see you again, as always. Um, we've uh, enjoyed your contribution uh, to proceedings and um, you can communicate back to Jonathan on some of that stuff and if there's anything that he needs further you know he can come back to us and I think the other aspect that we were talking about at the beginning will um, officers will get in contact with you to have a, a discussion about the issues that you raised there okay thank um, you Jenny thank you thanks everybody for your attendance appreciate it thank you Jenny. bye 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 for now folks bye now